Hey everybody, I'm Dior, I'm an architect in Informatica Cloud. Um, been in Informatica for the last 10 years, in a few roles in R&D uh, mostly. Um, and I want really to talk about what we did with Kubernetes in the last year or so. And hey, hey guys, more Informatica guys here, hey. Um, so we want to share a little bit of what we did. Um, let's us just start to walk through that. So Informatica, at a glance, uh, we are the enterprise cloud data management company. It means we have a lot of products around data integration, different integration patterns, how data is moving in the enterprise. Um, we've been around for a while. We are a leader in the five magic quadrants. Um, 80 of the top 100 fortune companies are using Informatica. I mainly want to talk about uh, Informatica Cloud, which we offer the enterprise integration platform as a service. Okay, that's uh, the main idea here. And what I really wanted you guys to get from that nice um, Five Gardner Magic one is that we have a lot of enterprise customers. Um, our um, infrastructure is really reliable for data pipelines inside those large enterprises, so reliability is important, right? Um, and we have been around for a long time. We are 26 years now. Um, so we have also a lot, a lot of legacy, like everybody loves, okay? That's, that's how that works. Um, so we started to be really a cloud-first company four years ago, building a new um, platform, microservice platform, that different products around the organization are onboarding to. And we are around 4,000 people at Informatica, which means we have, we have also a lot of products. And to make that transition between an on-prem to a cloud-based product is challenging and interesting, and we can talk a lot about that. Um, but we've grown, and much more traction got to this cloud services. And basically, we hit a wall. This number is also a bit uh, outdated. We have like 15 production clusters now. And the level of automation, the level of deployments that we really want to do slowed us down. And we reached to that kind of facility that we really need to revamp our CI CD pipelines, revamp the way that we automate. So we, we just wanted to adopt Kubernetes to do that. Hey, I don't need to tell people why to adopt Kubernetes, right? We, don't want to go with that. But for us, the immutable infrastructure to improve the deployment, the cadence, that was definitely the top uh, reasons. So we use a pretty standard Kubernetes stack, um, currently only on Amazon. I forgot to, to mention that we need to be multi-cloud too. That was an easy Kubernetes uh, giveaway too. Uh, we, we have uh, an Azure GCP, and but mostly on AWS, so we started our stack on EKS. Um, just pretty standard Helm, we use Spinnaker too. Don't want to drive too much into that. So the important thing in this talk is, okay, we're starting to move to Kubernetes, and we really try to understand how we are not Kubernetes experts, right? We have a lot of other already legacy, non-legacy, some new, some less new. How do we really do that? How we do that migration process? Um, and really how it comes down to how we get the organizational confidence to, to do that. That's the more, most important part of this talk. So visibility, we are all here to get visibility. Um, not related to Kubernetes, but in general, we've been Sumo customers for over four years now. Um, across the organization, hundreds of users um, logging in to get operational insights, business insights. Mostly important for me, from the dev SRE kind of uh, point of view, is how different product groups can really communicate based on data, right? So whether it's customer support with a different product that doesn't know all the other guys, how all of them can really just share a Sumo query and everybody can come together on the, on, on the same level easier, okay? So that's kind of, you know, different time zones, we're across globally, really important to base your discussion based on data. Okay, so this is kind of the data that we are looking on, um, HRProxy, Kafka, RDSs, a lot of this stuff. We're basically a Java shop. There's a lot of Java Tomcat logs, probably a bit more than what we have now on the terabytes, real-time alerts and all of that. But we really focused on making a lot of alerts based on logs for us to really work well. I had this last year Illuminate talk about that. We can talk a little bit more if you like later about that. Okay, now when we went to Kubernetes, at first we thought, okay, great, Sumo is logs. We can definitely use Sumo for logs. It actually um, gives much better automation, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that, but as the guys explained, you just use one deployment on Kubernetes and you don't need to, like happens every once in a while, you forget to run this collector setup on this node. Maybe the time zone is not set correctly on this uh, host. All kinds of things that real life happens, and on this specific host you haven't installed that Sumo collector, it's been down or something like that. In, in Kubernetes it's much easier. 
you just install it, it's a daemon set, at least I'm talking about the logs for, for, for that part, and it's just there. So it doesn't matter, new nodes comes, new no, uh, nodes goes away, the data is always there, logs always, uh, and, and that actually really improves the way that we automate uh, collection. Now metrics, they use Prometheus, we use Prometheus too already, um, kind of, kind of uh, also a drawback because if two are using the same Prometheus that can cause some problems, but that's you know, the modern way to really scrape metrics and events. So the important part to see here is finally you have um, a way to get all those free logs, events, metrics that you really want to look on when you're looking on a Kubernetes cluster on one solution. And that was very important for us. Okay? We used metrics from Grafana a little bit, but the guides are looking there and all the guides are looking on application logs. Definitely not when you really need to do another step and see the Kubernetes events. So really tie all of those together brings huge, um, huge intelligence for us. Okay? Uh, we'll talk about specific cases where it really helps. We can live a little bit. So when you set up this, we have been a part of this uh, beta program. Um, and as, as, as it takes, you need some time to troubleshoot. This is a harder or a more, you need to know a little bit the infrastructure when you deploy this. So they have a dashboard for troubleshooting the setup itself because you know, it has events, it has metrics, it has logs. You need to see if it all works, so you have a, some, some kind of a health check dashboard just to see if the Sumo setup works. That is really nice, okay? So getting context, uh, I guess you guys saw that many times before, I just want to say from our perspective again, you, when you have this auto-discoverability, like for the first time, and I think you all of you Sumo users will acknowledge that Doing source categories is really awful. And uh, people that don't know Sumo, the hardest part for people is where, where's the landing page, right? How to, how to start looking on their data. And actually this explore, once you just have, you don't do anything, you just install Sumo and all your clusters just appear there, which is magic for us, right? You, you used to never had that in Sumo, right? You need to collect, you need to create a dashboard. You need to email that dashboard to somebody. It was very hard. Now just you click on explore and all the clusters are there, which is mind blowing. Okay, at least for me. Um, sure, and the important thing is again to tie metrics and events and logs. So people they can, can just go and see which namespace it is. We kind of have a different, uh, each namespace is a different environment in a sense. So it's actually easier to explain to people, okay, this is the namespace, this is the environment, that's the cluster it resides to. Easy to communicate with the infrastructure guys about oh, which EKS is this. Okay, so it gives auto discoverability with all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, I just uh, try to illustrate a little bit what do you get from a metrics perspective, which you stand on a cluster, so a total cluster overview, um, on, and when you get to an actual node view, so a specific node, and that's the, how you can really troubleshoot if this is a problem in a specific node, in an older cluster, all this kind of thing. I don't want to go too much into that, you saw it in other um, places too. So when we wanted to migrate, going back to the migration story, um, it was very important for us to decide on a side-by-side -side architecture because this is going to take more than a year for sure, right? We have a lot of services, a lot of regions. Um, it was very important for us to be able to push something to Kubernetes, put some traffic through, but still be able to roll back really easily, okay? We were not trusting this, okay? We were not trusting ourselves that we know how to operate this. We really wanted to have a safe switch in any point in time, okay? And this is, makes it much more complicated too, but that's life, right? Um, um, that's kind of what we have, our AWS stack, AWS is kind of like uh, the legacy stack. Right? As services, we use a lot of HA proxies, ELB that fronts them, and that's how basically traffic flows. And that HA proxy setting just said, do you, does this service get um, traffic from or to Kubernetes or to the existing stack? That's the base. So what we did, what we are doing now is we want to move it service by service and environment by environment. So we don't just do you know, a full blown or even a bulk. We just take one service, show it in Sumo in the dashboards both before and after, put some traffic and just see if those uh, patterns change or not, right? That's pretty easy. Not that easy, hard to do, but you know, save us a few time where you can really roll back easily, right? gaining this organizational confidence. Okay, so just putting those screens side by side with a nice war room, we put those side by side in a war room and just look on that for an hour, okay? 
just a little reminder, the golden signals, that's kind of what we usually look for, plus some specifics for that service, right? So that's what we'll see on before and after moving to Kubernetes, plus some specific APIs. I gave you this example of uh, one of our services, the one that does import-export. So it has those normal latency, distribution, response code, all this stuff with a bit of a matrix, like CPU time plus um, response code for specific APIs, which are most important for that service. Right? So you can really know, is it okay or not? Okay, now, some people, for us at least, it was very important to make developers, to make the guys that actually troubleshoot the problems, know what's going on. This is, and this was a huge pain up front for us. We didn't know how to, or let's put it this way, Infrastructure guys might have went to some Kubernetes classes, maybe know a bit more about Kubernetes. What, what about developers? How will they know the system? How will they be able to know where their service runs? What is the matrix related? How can they really do that? And, and we felt this with those Sumo dashboards, it actually gave a really nice intro for them, right? So they, they can just go, since it's a service centric, they, and they're, they're the service owners, right? So they care only about their service. They can just go to their service, see where it is deployed and get all the logs right away. And again, not trivial thing. They don't need to know the source categories. They don't need to know the environment name, the cluster name, nothing. They go to the service and then drill down, which is really helpful in training, right? In training, getting more knowledge, that was very important. Okay. So some best practices that actually those dashboards expose. Uh, those out of the box dashboard tells you a little bit. Um, and they force you to think, right? And, and we use that for that. We are not Kubernetes experts from day one. We wanted to gain more knowledge and, and, and using Sumo dashboards really helped us with that, right? So once you go into the dashboard, first thing you see is limits, requests, um, really important to fill those in, even though you are not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure how, how many of you guys running Kubernetes in production? Um, okay, not a lot, so great. So it's a great audience. <laughs> um, so this is just a little bit of examples to know what are the requests and limits and they actually be per uh, pod or per namespace, okay, to be able to find that isolation level that you guys want. Important to understand the difference between of that and, and really to see when you guys exceed that, right? So you can take simple problems like um, memory, how much predefined memory you get, how much you limit the memory in real time, when a pod is getting killed by out of memory, all those things you can really visualize out of the box with Sumo, so you really understand what it means too. So that's, that's a nice thing, basically for noisy neighbor, right? So the problem is that Kubernetes solves in this, right? You don't want to put one container that hogs all the CPU from that node, and then you have no idea what's causing your other services to run slower. Okay, so those things are pretty much uh, for that. Um, and the first thing you see when you're getting there is this breakdown by different dimensions, right? So you have CPU, memory, usage, requests, limit, and all of them are break down with different pod, namespace, cluster, okay? So that, that's a very important, uh, it's a very big dimensions to do yourself, and you get that right away. So that's nice. Um, I'll switch gears a little bit. Um, one thing that we really like to do is to convert dashboards into alerts, because nobody likes to watch on dashboards. Dashboards is nice. You can go in, see a little bit, but really to make it into actionable alerts, that's the important thing. So what we do always is, you know, take the, what the dashboard, take the out-of-the-box dashboard, just see what the query is, convert it into an alert. That helps greatly, right? So uh, what we did, we have just nodes becoming not ready and crash loop, which is the most common thing that can happen um, from various reasons. We just turn it into a webbook alert and that's very useful. Okay, just a little sample here. Um, Okay, nobody sees that. Never mind. Um, the thing is, you, I just wanted to show that the crash loop back off reason here, that's where we monitor, and then you get all the other metadata free, right? So you get which cluster is it, which namespace is it, so you know a lot of context with this alert already. Some struggles when you migrate to Kubernetes. Um, things change, okay? Collectors changes, the source, all this wonderful metadata. It's not the same that you had on your old stack, so you really need to rewrite a lot of alerts. That's, that's how it is, okay? Um, time zone, very, very, uh, not a nice thing. You always need, if you don't have, like us, we have multiple time zones on our logs, not that easy to solve because, again, you have, before you had a collector, you can set us on, our, on the collector levels. That's what we did. And now you basically have one collector that gets everything, so you need to do some magic there. 
Okay? Um, Prometheus versions, when you deploy and you have different, everything is sort of the same Prometheus, it's not that easy to configure always. There needs to be some knowledge there. Okay? And although they got some uh, nice uh, metrics and costs and all that, you, you need to evaluate because this is new data. Right? So it's a lot of data coming through. Need to push some, some notice on that. Okay, so I have five minutes. I will have some common issues that we saw. Uh, and you guys can ask some things uh, more. Let you digest all of that. Uh, things that we saw in the really early adoption, things that happens to us more than once, probably. And we made all of this into alerts. So every time this happens now, we get alerted at least. So we know what's going on. Um, one thing to note, Readiness and liveness probe that you define per deployment basically tells Kubernetes when to direct traffic to it and when to kill it, okay? which are not the same. So readiness is when you direct traffic. That's nice, ready, one out of one kind of uh, things that you see in Kubernetes. But liveness will tell it when to kill it. And for us, it's very different, right? So we, we don't want to direct traffic if it doesn't respond for like five seconds, 10 seconds, so let it cool off. But we don't want to kill it because things can still be in motion. We really don't want to... Um, lose any, any, any packet, it's really important for us. Again, enterprise, all of this stuff. Um, so that's really important to notice. JVM only Java and containers, read something about it, read some blogs, it's not that easy to. Um, the most basic thing is to use this, use uh, C, C groups memory limits. That will help you not to set, specify the same memory limits both on the Kubernetes deployment side and on your heap size on the JVM. Um, which can cause, of course, out of memory exception and killing nodes and all of that. Not, not nice things to get. Working nodes in run ready state, that's very important to keep an eye on, to keep an alert on. Actually, not just a dashboard, but an alert, because weird things can happen. Um, since everybody using the same infrastructure and disk space is actually not something that is very controllable, like CPU and memory are, but disk space is a bit, hey, you should not do it, it's a cloud native. Tough life, we do have things that's right on disk. And if things are writing on disk and make those disks or those nodes unavailable, that can really cause a lot of rescheduling, a lot of mess, and that happened, so. Um, yeah, a few event alerts for mount volume. So you, there's a lot of um, prerequisites that you deploy a pod, that you deploy, you think that the config map will be there, a secret will be there, very handy to keep an alert for that specific event. If the mount volume cannot be mounted, that's a problem, uh, and that happens. I think the one, one thing to note is, first again, though, there's a lot of metrics that we don't know about. You know, it's, a, it's very specific containers, things that you're real, not really sure what it means. Um, this one, for example, we thought we just, the memory was just spiking. There was a graph, I mean, a Grafana graph, you can see it too. And the memory exceeds the container allow memory, the limit. It turns out it's not really the one that Kubernetes is monitoring to kill one, okay? Again, very technical, but um, the, the important thing is those metrics are not always the same as we were used to in the normal, in the normal um, uh, image world. So always need to revi revisit those and read and have Sumo dashboards to really help you a little bit with that too. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you.